I wished I could have shown the video that we just saw online. Uh, if you'd like to have it, I'll have John post that. We welcome you. Can we welcome those on the web? If you get a chance, go to that before you actually, uh, well, you're going to listen to the sermon, but um, it's something that everybody needs to see. Jesus is coming. I'll say that again. Jesus is coming. And the question that the Lord put upon my heart to ask you today is, are you ready? Are you really ready for his coming? You know, uh, for the last 36 hours, I have been in such warfare and turmoil in my spirit to the point that all I could do was just lay down because I really couldn't even stand. I was so tired and so overwhelmed by just what I was sensing, what I was feeling. And I was questioning the Lord and saying, Lord, what, what do you want me to preach on? What do you want me to share with in the body of Christ? Because, saints, I want to tell you this. I have nothing to share unless he speaks. You know, we can find great riddles, we can find great stories, we can talk about great things that the Word talks about. You know, I can give you tours of Israel, it's all great stuff, but unless God's in the midst of it, it's only just stuff. It could be only religion. Amen? And so the Lord woke me up this morning, actually uh, at 11.59, um, I had nothing from the Lord other than warfare. So I got up until 1.30 this morning and I just, I just felt no leadership to go anywhere other than just this weight that was upon me. So I went back to bed, um, and I slept till around 5 o'clock, 4.30 or 5. And he woke me up again, and I got up, and I said, God, what are you talking on? And he took me to 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 7, and that's where we're going to start today. 1 Peter 4, verse number 7. But before we go there, I want to tell you this. The election no matter which way it goes, which we're believing the way it's going to go, how many know will not stop the Antichrist from coming? I'll say this, even no matter what happens in this world, there will be one day a new world order. Amen? And I will say this, no matter what man or church does, there will be an end. And there's not a thing anyone can do to stop it. It's already been spoken. God has already said it. That pretty well settles it. Amen? It settles it. Jesus is coming. And as I woke up this morning, the Lord put this scripture on my heart and said, Jesus is coming. Do you know that? Oh, we all can say, yeah, Jesus is coming. And we can all look at this and say, wait a minute, Peter. That was written 2,000 years ago. Well, can I say it's been 2,000 years now and we're a lot closer than what he was. And there's an urgency in the air, the urgency in the spirit that Jesus is coming. Peter starts out and reads it this way. But the end of all things is at hand. How close is your hand? It's pretty close, isn't it? And he's saying the end is that close. As close as your hand. Therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Go over for a moment to Second Peter. And we're going to look at chapter 1 and verse number 14. And look at what Peter says. Peter says, knowing, 1 Peter 1, 14, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Peter says, I'm about to go. I'm about to leave this earth. The Lord has shown me that my time is up. And Peter comes back and says, let me get serious right now. This is what Peter's saying. Now that God's shown me that I'm about ready to pass, I'm ready to go on and be with the Lord, we need to take a close look at the end of all things is His hand. Peter said, this is serious. This is life and death. This is a time which is coming and no one can stop it. Amen? It's a time in which we need to be sober. We need to be awakened. 
We need to understand that we need to have this fervent love one for another. Are you hearing me this morning? And what Peter's about to do, he's about to tell you how to prepare for the coming of the Lord. How many want to be prepared for the coming of the Lord? So Peter's final words is preparation. See, Peter doesn't say, hey, let me tell you where to put your money. Let me tell you what the economy is going to look like. Let me tell you, stock up on some food. Get ready because things are getting serious. See, Peter's not saying any of this. Peter's not saying, check out your investments. Find out where the stock market's going. Get yourself ready for survival. No, that's not what Peter's saying. Peter comes and says, the end of things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful. We need to be awake in church. This is not a time to panic. It's not a time to freak out. It's not a time to be afraid. How many know, I remember my father-in-law when he passed, he made this statement. He says, I'm passing, and he said, I know it's my time. He said, don't pray me back. He said, I've been, I've been preaching this my whole life, that there will be a day that I will stand before my Lord. He knew that it was a glorious time. He knew that there was no pain, no sorrow, no suffering. He knew that the former things were passing away, and he knew all things were going to become new. I mean, that's exciting to finally come to a conclusion where we realize that Jesus is going to bring everything back to its proper state. I'm excited about that. But there's a process that we have to go through to be ready. Amen? We need to be serious about this. We need to be deliberate about this. We need to be watchful about this. We know that the Bible says in 2 Timothy, I'm going to turn over there real quick, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And he tells us what the signs are going to look like. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I could quote it, but I want to read it to you. But know this. That in the last days. How many know we're in the last days? Perilous times will come. Troubled times will come. Difficult times will come. Dangerous times will come. Painful, fearful, grievous times will come. How many know they're here? Look what he says. For men will be lovers of self rather than lovers lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedience to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people... What does he say? Turn away. away. See, these are people that have chose to walk like the world and they don't want to change. They have made a decision, as Mary had said one time, they drew a line in the sand and said, I'm not changing. I'm going to stay right on course with where I'm at because they don't believe what we believe. They don't understand that there is an eternal damnation that comes by not knowing Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. Amen? 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 These are people that are covetous. These are people that are even preachers that are preaching deception. Come on, somebody. The Bible says in Matthew 24, there's going to be wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines, diseases, pestilences. But then he says, but the time's not yet. Then he goes on and says, there's going to be some that's going to be martyred, some that's going to be beheaded, some that's going to be killed. But he said, the time is still not yet. But he says later, this is when it will happen. When the gospel of the good news is preached, then the end will come. We have a responsibility to warn people about what's coming. We have a responsibility to let them know that we are in the last days. Amen? And Peter starts out and he says, look, we need to be sober. We need to be awakened. We need to realize that we need to put some self-control into this thing. We need to realize that we are responsible for our part. What is our part? Making sure the gospel's going out. Making sure the word's being preached. Making sure people are hearing the end is coming. Not that we're telling them turn or burn. It's the fact that we're telling them, hey, you don't have to stay here. You don't have to be a part of this. 
You have an opportunity by surrendering your life to the one who saved your life because you don't know how to save it. You don't know how to deliver it. You don't know how to bring it to its full restoration. Matter of fact, if you continue the way you're going, you're going to find the grave and what's on the other side. But how many know when you find Jesus, you find no grave? Because the grave has no sting. Come on, the grave has no victory over you. Jesus is the victory. Say that with me. Jesus is the victory. And he tells us here, look, let's go back to uh, 1 Peter chapter um, 4. And let's, let's break this down a little bit. He says, the end is at hand. Hold up your hand. The end is at hand. It's right there. We know that if you don't accept Jesus right now, there's a possibility that you won't have the rest of the day. You don't know what's coming. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know if there's an accident on the way to happen. You don't know if he may even come back even before we get done with this sermon. We need to take it seriously. Amen? Therefore, be what? Be what? Sober. Serious. Take this to heart. This is real. And be watchful in your prayers. Saints, we need to be praying. We need to be praying for the lost. We need to be praying for our families. We need to be praying for our communities. We need to be praying for our friends, our relatives, our loved ones. And we need to be praying for those we don't know. Paul said, pray without ceasing. Paul was in constant fellowship with God in behalf of the things in which he had to deal with. Constant fellowship. Amen? And I believe that we're in the days and in the last days and we need to walk with the leadership of the Holy Ghost. See, without the leadership of the Holy Ghost, it's your leadership living your life for you. But when you're walking with the leadership of the Holy Spirit, He's constantly convicting and, and, and leading and guiding your heart and guiding your spirit to what the next step is. You can discern it. You can sense it. You know, the Bible says that when you really walk with the Lord, He directs your path. So if He's directing your path, He runs into people like Jimmy Mills that, that she's over ministering to and Jimmy has a heart attack and has to go to the emergency room and possibility of, of open heart surgery. But how many know her being there helped get, make sure his heart was right? See, our being here in this land, we need to wake up. We need to be sober. We need to be self-controlled. And we need to be ready right now, prayerfully seeking what God wants us to be about. It's life and death. My mother was sitting in a chair one day. And uh, she was talking to my little brother that was in Wichita. And she was telling him all the things she had learned about the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. And kept saying to him, Ronnie, Ronnie, you need, you need to turn your life over to Jesus. Ronnie, Ronnie, you need to give your whole heart to Jesus. Ronnie, and she's telling him all this stuff. And right in the middle of it, she stops. And she just realized that she hadn't turned her heart over to Jesus. That day, sitting in my chair, telling my little brother, my mother, telling my little brother he needs to give his heart to Jesus, got radically saved. Come on, somebody. I don't know how God's going to do it. I don't know when He's going to do it. One's going to plant. One's going to water. But God promises there will be an increase. I had a young man by the name of Jerry Blackwell. Loved the brother. But boy, he was messed up. But you know, I kept, I kept pursuing him. I kept praying for him. I kept loving him. One day I went by to pick him up because he'd been working with me and we had to go to Gerard and he worked with me and the next day I really needed him because what we did that day meant there was more work the next day because we were preparing for the big job. I went by his home and he wasn't there. I said I told to his wife, where's Jerry? He says, oh, he ran off with some girls last night. I don't know when he'll be back. Two little kids at home. Her, her heart was broke. Oh, I was ticked off at Jerry. Oh, I was madder than a hornet. You know, thinking about me, thinking about what I needed, thinking about how much I needed him in my day that day. And you know, I went to work and, and I had a terrible day. Why? Because my attitude was off. I wasn't being sober. I wasn't being diligent. I wasn't really thinking about anybody else but myself. I got to that job, and I mean, it was a hard day. I come back home. I, I was real late that night. I got up the next morning, and I'm, I have to pass right by Jerry's house. And I said within myself, I am not stopping. 
I am not stopping. I am going to drive on by. You know, he hurt me. He let me down. He did these things against me. And I'm just going to travel on by. I want to tell you what happened. I'm driving along. And all of a sudden, my foot hit the brake. My wheels turned into his place where he was living. Matter of fact, right down here on West 7th when it was Roach Coach Motel. Remember that? Pulled right there in front of his place. And I'm sitting there stunned going, what just happened? I walk up to the door. I knock on the door. And Jerry comes to the door. And oh, he had his head low. And I said, Jerry, are you okay? He goes, yeah. I said, you want to work today? He goes, yeah. Well, I had a 45-minute drive to Girard. I had his undivided attention. I got to show the love of God. I got to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, of course, he said that day he wasn't ready to accept Christ. But I know that I did some planning. I did some watering. That was probably early summer. In December, he moved to St. Louis, Missouri. New Year's, I guess it was just right after Christmas, uh, his wife moved back here because Jerry was working in a convenience store and these kids came in and robbed it. And they left the store, him tied up, left the store, but one of the guys ran back in and said, we can't have any witnesses and killed him. Jerry's wife, Debbie, came and told us what had happened. I was broken. I was sick. I was like, oh, God, how could Jerry pass like this? I don't really know if he really accepted Jesus or not. Well, my pastor, Spiritfield, Louis Threeton, left a message on my answering machine that day while I was at work grieving over Jerry all day. And he said, don't forget. And he said, I don't know why I'm telling you this. Want a plant, want a water. But God promises an increase. I knew that day that I'm going to see Jerry again. I knew I planted. I knew I watered. But let me tell you, if I wouldn't have planted and I wouldn't have watered, what could have been the outcome? But I knew that day that I had to wake up. I had to be sober. I had to be watchful. I had to take this relationship with God seriously. Saints, I don't think Christianity takes this relationship with God very serious. I think many of us are just living our lives, paying our bills, getting our paychecks, balancing our checks and balances in house, home, and all the things we have to do instead of realizing this is life and death information. You, like Peter, has a day in which you're going to pass and go be with the Lord. You don't know if it's today, tomorrow, next week, but it's coming soon. Just like it is with the world that needs to know that Jesus is coming And it's at hand. Are you hearing me this morning? James chapter 5 verse number 17. I think it's 17 and 18 says. Be patient. Walk in peace. Don't give up. Until the coming of the Lord. I'll say that again. Be patient. Walk in peace. Don't give up. Until the coming of the Lord. I'll say that again. Be patient. Walk in peace. Don't give up until the coming of the Lord. I'm going to say it again. Be patient. Walk in peace. Don't give up until the coming of the Lord. We have a fight that we're in. And we win. Amen. It goes on and says, See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. Say early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. I'm telling you, saints, we've had a former rain, Acts chapter 2. But we've got a latter rain that's coming. And we need to be a people ready for the latter rain. How are we going to be ready for the latter rain if we aren't planting and watering? Because if we're not planting and watering, there is no reason for a latter rain. Because think about it. In Old Testament, the early rain came and the seed was planted. It watered the seed so the leaves could produce. In the fall, the latter rain came to finish off the crop for the harvest. In the Spirit, God is doing the same thing. We've had an early rain and the latter rain is about to come to those who are prepared with their leaves, come on, with their fruit, with their gifts of the Spirit so that the world can experience Him. And He's looking for you. 
and he's looking for me. Amen? You know, I read an article the other day that, that CNN and New York Times and all of these uh, Wall Street people are going to yoga. They're meditating. They're knowing something's coming. So they're trying to find peace. Um, we tell you what, there's no peace in that. Amen? The only peace that we can ever have is to find a secret place of the Most High God and dwell under the shadow of the Almighty. See, we know when they say they're going to go into their yoga room, all we need to do is tell them we're going to go into the room where the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is at. We're the Alpha and the Omega, the one who has the beginning and the end. Hallelujah. We're going into a place where we can be sober, where we can be watchful, and where we can hear from heaven what our part is to be until He comes. Because saints, they're doing yoga for them. We're going into the secret place for Him and for them. Because it's not about us. And Peter knew this. And Peter says, above all things, we need to be prepared. Above all things, we need to think about what it takes for people to survive. And above all things, we don't want to walk in the wisdom of the world. We want to walk in the leadership of God. And Peter is telling us this. The end is coming. Be serious. Wake up. Be watchful. Stay praying. You know, a prayerless church will never accomplish anything for God. That's why I'm calling us to prayer. Next year, it's all about praying. It's all about seeking God. It's all about seeking what He wants. It's all, all about being right in the middle of what He wants accomplished. And how many know we're not going to do that without prayer? I talked to the pastor uh, a couple years ago in James River in um, Nixa. And uh, the question was asked him, what was it like when you first started your church? He said, well, he said, I'll be honest with you. The elders came to me and said, do you think that you can take over 100 people and make it 1,000? He said, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know how, but I think through prayer, God does. How many people are they running at James River between all their campuses? Do you know? 20,000 people. 20,000 people. A man that found out prayer was the centerpiece to the presence of the Lord. Their services on Wednesday nights seem to be some of their most awesome services that they have. Because they pray. If they have time, they'll do some teaching. But if not, prayer is the centerpiece to building their congregation. Amen? See, Peter says we need to have a fervent love for one another. Say fervent love. Look at this. A fervent love with one another for love will cover a multitude of sins. I mean, now we're all working at our salvation. We've all got some issues. Come on. We've all got moments. We've all got stuff that we do that we said we really wished he didn't. Come on. Whether it's watching wrong programs, 30 seconds of, of news or whatever else it might be. I mean, no, there's a conviction of the Holy Spirit. See, when we're in prayer and relationship with God, there's a conviction. When we're not in fellowship with God, not in prayer with God, we'll have what we call condemnation. What is the difference between condemnation and conviction? Condemnation is for your doom. Conviction is for your eternal glory. I mean, no, God is a convictor, not a condemner. Amen? If you're walking in condemnation, you need to cast it off. It's not of God. If you're walking in conviction, you need to listen. Why? Because God's trying to help you. Amen? He's not trying to hurt you. Amen? So when we walk in fervent love for one another, we'll know the mercy of God. We'll know that forgiveness. We'll know that compassionate. We'll know that, that, that thing that, that we can forbear with that person that's done wrong. The same way God does it. Thank God for mercy. Come on, thank God for mercy. But not only mercy, but love. See, when you're walking with God because you know that the, the, the end time is at hand and you're walking with love, you realize it's not about you anymore. See, real love points outward. Come on. It has nothing in return that it wants other than you to receive what they have. You know, it's not like going to get a cup of sugar and I'll bring it back in a week. 
Can I borrow a cup of sugar? How many took the sugar back? I mean, really? I remember my mom used to send me next door for a cup of lard. Remember, they used to use a lot of lard? So I'd go next door to get a cup of lard. And I said, Can I, my mama wants to borrow a cup of lard. My mama never took a cup back. Come on. Real love gives. Real love is in constant seeking out your best interest. Peter said, look. The end is at hand. You need to wake up. You need to be sober. You need to be praying. And above all things, above all things, come on, above all things, look at this, have fervent love one for another. Fervent love literally looks at everybody from the same playing field. Well, I can love you, but I can't love you. No, it looks at everybody from one view. And Peter said, look, if the, if, the, if the end is coming and it's at hand, you better know what love is. Above all things, have fervent love. Fervent love. Fervent love for your mate. Fervent love for your children. Fervent love for your neighbor. Fervent love for your city. Come on. Fervent love for everyone. Fervent. What does fervent mean? Come on, somebody. What is fervent? It means to burn in reality, to help them with something they need. I had, a, I had a couple come to me one time and she said, You know, the way he acts, I'm just not going to cook for him anymore. I'm not going to clean for him anymore. He can do his own laundry. He can take care of his own stuff. I am done. And I said to her, um, Who does the cooking? She says, I do. I said, who usually does the laundry? She said, I do. I said, who usually picks up the things around the house? She said, I do. I said, what happened to your fervent love for the Lord? Because the Bible says your submission isn't for submission. Your submission is because you're submitted to doing what God wants accomplished. Why does he say to the husbands, husband, love your wife as Christ loves the church, where he lays his life down for them. You know, he did, he's, he's not laying his life down just for her. He's laying his life down the way Christ laid his life down so that she can reap the benefits of it. We don't stop doing what we're called to do if we really walk in fervent love and we're concerned about someone else's eternal welfare. Amen. We don't walk around mumbling and grumbling. Look what he says. Next verse. But hospitable to one another without grumbling. Come on, saints. We want the latter rain. We better prepare ourselves. We want the outpouring of God's Spirit to do great things in the last days. Let me tell you what. You better know what fervent love is. And you better quit your grumbling. I mean, the quickest way for the Holy Spirit to leave is for you to be a grumbler. How many here love hanging around negative people? Oh, come on. Y'all do it. Come on. How many love it? You absolutely hate it, don't you? Because negative people will draw you down. How many know negative people will cause you that aren't negative to grumble and mumble? That's not of God. Amen? Peter's saying we've got to change this stuff before the end comes. We've got to get some stuff right. Amen? Peter's saying, you better plan for his coming, because he's coming. And you better get things right. Amen? How many know that we can hinder the move of the Holy Spirit if we're not careful? He can be grieved. Amen? Look at 1 Thessalonians for a moment. I believe it's chapter 5 we're going to look at. Verse number 1, but... Concerning the times, the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourself know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Hmm. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. How many know if you're pregnant, that child's going to come? You ain't going to hold that child back. Amen? But you, brethren... Are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of 
of hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Is that what you're doing? Are you comforting? Are you edifying? Are you lifting other people up? Are you looking for ways to overlook the fault and start showing them the good of what God wants to accomplish? Are you always fault finding, grumbling, mumbling, telling somebody else what they need to change or what they need to do? Amen. Come on. What did Peter tell us? We need to pray. We need to be awakened to our prayer life to learn how to have a fervent love for that person. I asked a brother this morning how someone was doing and he said, they're just lost. He didn't say, oh, they got this problem and they got that problem and they're doing this. No, what did he say? They're just lost. And you can hear it in it. People are lost. People who have these problems are in darkness. And the only way they can see is if light shows up. But if darkness comes and tries to tell them how bad their darkness is, how bad your darkness because the Bible says if you say you're walking in the light, but you're really walking in darkness, how great is your darkness? To me, that's pretty dark. Amen? Amen? Peter says in 1 Peter 4, 7, love covers. I love that. Yeah, it covers a multitude of sin, but love covers. Love washes it away. Why? Because love has a different perspective than the one who sins. Or the darkness that's upon them. Amen? Amen? we got to deal with this stuff. Jesus is coming. He's at hand. Amen? See, if you deal with things from the world's perspective, it's going to hinder your spiritual growth. It's going to stop the call that He's placed in your life. It could even stop, or stop the relationship that you have with Him. I mean, no, that's serious stuff. And I, the worst one, I think, is that it'll keep you from moving forward. How many want to move forward? How many want to grow in the things of God? Then we need to take heed to what Peter is telling us here. The end is at hand. We need to be serious. For, serious. We need to wake up. We need to pray. He's telling us how to do it. He's telling us how to get through it. Amen? Is this helping anybody this morning? He's telling us that if we do this and carry this fervent love, we're actually going to be able to cover the multitudes of sins that are going on in their life. How is that? We're showing them what love is. We're showing them what it takes. We're showing them how to come out. We're praying for them. I mean, I thank God that she was able to talk to Jimmy. Because Jimmy always tells you, I've known Jimmy since the 80s, and he said, I've got a story. I've got a story. But the unfortunate part is he's not living in the right place in his story. But because someone came and watered what was already planted, I believe he's got a new story to tell. I'm expecting that. Why? Because God says plant water and promised increase. Promised increase. Promised increase. I just speak that over Jimmy right now. Promised increase. Promised increase. You will behold the Lord. In the power of His might. And know the resurrected one personally. For the day of your salvation is at hand. We claim that over your life, Jimmy. In Jesus' name. You know, it's sad that when we as Christians go and pollute those who aren't. It's very sad. We say names to them that we shouldn't even identify with. You know, I remember growing up, my dad used to always get mad at us if I ever told my friend they were losers. Or if I'd said something negative, he said, I'll tell you what, I'll put you in the car and take you downtown and show you what real losers are. I'll show you what a real life is without the things that you have. My dad used to always threaten us with that stuff. Why? Because my dad was trying to get us to see things from a different perspective. Peter's trying to help us see it from a different perspective. Amen? So you have to ask the question, what about you? Are you walking in love that puts everyone else first? Because if you're putting everything else first, guess what? He covers the multitude of sins because you're not perfect. <laughs> not one person in this house that's perfect. 
How many know we need the blood of Jesus to cover some stuff? Amen? Are you ready? Are you really ready when things fall apart? Because when you look out in the world, they're falling apart. Are you ready? Do you have the right fervency? Are you taking it to the Lord? Are you letting the love cover a multitude of sins? Amen? Or are you just going to let the bottom fall out and say, Okay, Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. He made you and me responsible for those that are out there. Amen? And we have to make sure, the only thing we've got to make sure of, other than going out and minister, is make sure we keep our hearts right. Get serious. Wake up. Realize how serious this is. Realize how much love He had for you. And how much love to one another. Be a good host. Be a person that no matter what you do, you're willing to go the extra mile. You're willing to give a little bit more. It's life and death. It's what's going to make it or break it. I tell you, it was awesome uh, when I met Linda because, of course, I was a Jehovah's Witness and she's a born again Baptocostal. Raised Baptist, became Pentecostal, so she's a Baptocostal. And we used to go toe to toe in Scripture. Oh, yeah. We'd go toe to toe and the, the fire alarms would go off. We'd go toe to toe and the phone would begin to ring. We'd go toe to toe and sirens would come down the block. I mean, always something trying to bring a distraction. You know what I'm talking about? Because that's exactly what the enemy does. He wants to distract us. He wants us to get busy. He wants us to focus more on us and what we're going through and forget everybody else because I'm trying to work out my own salvation. You can't work out your own salvation. Jesus is the only one that knows how to work it out for you. And when you're about his business, he takes care of you. It's a, it's a kingdom principle. Put the kingdom of God first and all these other things will be added unto you. Amen. You know, Peter understood what it was like. In the la his last days. Matter of fact, scholars believe he had one pair of shoes, one change of clothes. Come on. And how many know he lived from moment to moment on the food that he had to eat? Isn't that what Jesus told him? Take nothing with you. Here, we, I, I walked through my house yesterday and I was going, God, I've got a lot of stuff. Stuff that I don't even need. Stuff that just sits on the shelf that I gotta, I gotta, you know, move around every once in a while just to make it look clean. And here Peter is, he's got very little. And he's going, hey, Jesus is coming. So I'm not gonna tell you about stuff. I'm not gonna tell you about investments. I'm not gonna tell you about money plans. I'm not gonna tell you about stocking up on food. Why? Because he knew where his help came from. He knew who he trusted in. Amen? And he knew that we had to forgive one another. And he's telling us here, we need to learn to forgive. I, I've got some people in my life that I pray for every day that forgiveness would come. If they walked into this place, I can tell you right now, I have forgiven them. My prayer is they'll learn to forgive me. I had a person the other day that I just felt like I just needed to call and, and just talk with. And most awesome conversation reconciliation and it wasn't the fact of who did wrong it was the fact that I knew that it wasn't right isn't that really what you do when there's unforgiveness in the house you know if Matt hurt me and I knew Matt hurt me but Matt really didn't know he hurt me I mean, it would be very difficult for him to call me so what do I do I call him right it's important that we recognize what we're supposed to do. The Bible says in Matthew 6, don't worry about your life. Just as I've taken care of the birds of the air, the lilies of the field, how much more will I take care of you? He even likens that to Solomon's temple, right in his glory. Amen? Just as God takes care of all that, he'll take care of you. Don't worry about investments. Don't worry about money. Don't worry, unless God tells you one way or another. But let me tell you what, saints, we need to be concerned about Jesus' is coming. And we need to take this very seriously. Because Zechariah prophesied that there would be a former and latter rain. And how many know if we're positioned right, we will experience the outpouring? How many want to experience the outpouring? So, to, to experience the outpouring, guess what? Peter says here. Pray. 
Say it with me. Pray. Pray. Walk in fervent love with one another. And love covers a multitude of sins. And he doesn't stop. He says, be hospitable. You know, if your enemy came up to you, could you be hospitable? (laughs) You should. Amen. Choose to bless them, not curse them. Choose to, to, to like them instead of retaliate. Speak words of blessings instead of words of condemnation. I mean, no, there's only one convictor and his name is Holy Ghost. There's only one teacher. His name is Holy Ghost. Right? Who teaches you, Holy Ghost? You might hear sermons and hear clips from the Bible, but let me tell you, it goes in, you chew upon it, you mutter on it, you think about it, and then it becomes a spiritual thing. Remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. So how does it come? First, you have the Word. It's spoken. You hear it. You chew upon it. You bring it to your memory and your processing. And then your spirit man goes, that was Daddy. And it takes it and holds it. Say like 1 Peter 2.24, by the stripes of Christ I'm healed. I mutter on it, chew up on it. Oh, wait, he said what he was beaten for and the stripes that was on his back and by those stripes I'm healed. And the spirit man goes, that's dad. So the more you take it in, the more you build the spirit man, the more the spirit man comes out instead of you. Amen? So we need to, what does it say? Be hospitable to one another. And I want to say this, saints, very strongly. Stop your grumbling. Oh, you know, you, 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 you get bothered by somebody, so you call up your best friend and go, I'm not gossiping or anything, but I've got to get this off my heart. Right? And you think that that's going to help? Because that's what? It's going to cause that person that's listening to you to start grumbling. You're not helping anything, are you? Amen? Not helping anything. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister to one another. How many here has received gifts? I see prophets and prophetesses and songwriters. I see teachers. I see administrators. You know, I see all sorts of giftings out here right now. And guess what? You need to be using your gift. That gift is for a purpose, to help one who has need of it. That's the whole purpose of the gift. So here he says, the end is coming. You need to be serious. You need to have fervent love for one another. You need to make sure that that love covers a multitude of sins. He says to be hospitable without grumbling. Watch what you speak. And as each has received a gift, minister it to one another. I love ministering the Word because I love the Word. So usually when somebody comes to me and needs counsel, I'm not on your side and I'm not on their side. I'm on his side. Whose side are you on? You want your view? You want their view? Or you want God's view? It's a choice. This is what Peter's telling us. He says, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So what am I really saying here? Jesus is close. I was up for the last 36 hours up and down and God just put it up on my heart. We have to make some changes. And it starts, judgment starts in the house of God. If you're mumbling and grumbling, you need to repent. If you're a person that's not walking in fervent love, you need to repent. If you're a person that is not following the context of what he's telling us here, you need to repent. Because look at verse 11. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. Wouldn't it be awesome if the body of Christ could grab a hold of this one? That every time Matt opened his mouth, all you heard was God speaking. Every time Sister Tracy opened a song, it's God speaking. Every time Mary brings a prophetic word, it's God speaking. Every time Josh says something about something, it's God speaking. Come on. Can you imagine if we were all speaking what God was speaking, what could happen? I think the latter rains would come. (coughs) I think the outpouring of God's Spirit would be here. Because what are the oracles of God? (coughs) It's one who speaks what he speaks. 
the one who stands in behalf of the one that he follows. Let's go this way. (coughs) It's a prophetic word that changes things. You know, drug addict that's out there on drugs, they can have hope. A lesbian, homosexual can have hope if you'll share that hope. God loves them. He don't love the sin, but He loves them. Amen? All we do is highlight the sin instead of the love that should be with it. That's why they struggle with Christians is because they feel we're condemning them and we're not loving them. But how many know it's the love of God that will lead them to repentance? (coughs) Is this helping anybody today? Jesus is coming. (coughs) Thank you, Jeanette. If anyone ministers, who's that? Anyone. (coughs) If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong glory and dominion forever and ever. What is Peter saying? Jesus is coming. And we need to be about His business. We need to carry fervent love for all. We need to pray. We need to realize that we've been graced with gifts as stewards of God. And that the words that we speak, we better be careful. Because our words as Christians should be the oracles of God. Look at the last verse. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. You know, when I married my wife, I told her, I said, you know, I love you today, but I'm going to love you more tomorrow. I had a challenge. My challenge was, is to love her better today or tomorrow than I loved her today. I've got a big challenge. I challenge you today to love the people around you Tomorrow better than you loved them today. I guarantee you lives will change. Because everybody in the world is looking for. For love. Everybody in the world. Why do you think they're doing what they're doing? They're trying to cover up what they feel within themselves. Because they don't feel loved. But when you truly love. That's when they're totally delivered. For God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever. Whosoever is who? Shall believe what? On him. How are they going to believe on him if we're not sharing him? Amen. So today I'm going to challenge uh, the conclusion of our service to prayer. I've asked different ones to come. Trev, if you'll come. I'd like us to pray that God would forgive us. For the ought that we carry with one another. And that God would change our hearts. I like to say it this way with our congregation is. If you're going to truly be a child of God. Walk in instant forgiveness. Lord we just come before you. We thank you. Just that we can come together. Corporately, right now, mm. Lord, that we can <clears throat> seek you, seek the kingdom, and Father, that you begin to stir up our hearts um, of offense, Lord, mm. that you would put in our path those that have um, that maybe we buried <coughs> the offense that has come against us, and we we've, we've walked over it and we forgot about it, and we buried this offense. But Lord, I ask that you would just stir up in us uh, those that we need to forgive, whether it was uh, the other day or years. Lord, we just ask that you stir up in us, um, and we thank you. Holy Spirit, we thank you that, <laughs> that you've been doing this for a while. So you know the exact thing that you need to do. You know uh, how to, to do the inner workings of putting people in our path through uh, people that we see through social media, through the word, 
then Lord, you'd begin to stir up in us these offenses that we've buried, and that way they can be dealt with. And Lord, when you put those upon us, Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy that it's just a process. Yes, we can forgive immediately, but Lord, you often take us and give us just a journey and a process um, so that we are complete and we're not lacking anything yes. on that process of forgiveness. So Lord, we just put this in your hands. And Lord, I just thank you that you're so great at how you deal with each one of us individually. You, you know exactly what is needed in that process of forgiveness. And so Lord, just help us to, to be receptive to that. And Lord, I look forward to the testimonies that are gonna come forward yes. in the days uh, as we move forward through this forgiveness and you working it out in us, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Hallelujah, Matt, would you come? I wanna ask God to pour out the latter rain. You know, we, we have not, because we, I'm gonna ask God to pour out the rain. You ready for the rain? Just raise your hands as he prays. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Father, we're so thankful today for your promise mm. that you're going to pour out the latter rain, Lord. And Father, we're thankful that we're privileged people to be able to live in this time, the most exciting times when we're going to see the return Oh, of your son Jesus and Father God we know that you're not coming back for a weak anemic church one that is sickly but Lord we know that you're coming back for a church that is pure that is white that is spotless and that is full of your power and your glory and God we're believing and praying and seeking for a move of your Holy yes, Ghost hallelujah in our lives, each and every one of our lives, Father, as we've come before you. Lord, as we've laid ourselves bare, as we've repented, Father. As we've repented, Lord, of the things of our faults, our failures, our shortcomings. And God, we believe that you're going to accept our pure, clean hearts and you're going to send a move of the Holy Ghost like we have never seen before, yes, Father. Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. God, we know that you're going throughout the land searching for those that you can lay your glory upon. Father, that you're searching for your Elijahs and your Elishas who will walk in the power and the anointing of your spirit. You're searching for your Daniels, Lord, mm. who, will, who will not hear to the king's decree, Father, but we will seek you in prayer that we will be on our faces before you O god and father you're looking for your shadrach meshachs and abednegoes mm -hmm. who will not bow a knee to the king's image father who will not bow to this world or its systems lord but will stand boldly and will stand strong and father we know they're in even though they went through the fire even though they was placed in the furnace you was there with them father and when they came out the other side it says that the smell of smoke was not even upon them Hallelujah. lord because you were there with them and god we don't know necessarily what the days are ahead for us as individuals each and every one but we do know that you're in control and we do know that you're going to send a move of your Holy Ghost, that you're yeah. going to send the latter rain. Do it, Lord. Father, we receive that right now in Jesus' mm. name, that that work in hearts and lives today of everyone that is under the sound of my voice right now receive Thank you, Lord. the work of the Holy Ghost in your life, that you can walk in the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name we Jesus pray. Name. Amen. Jeanette, would you come and pray for families, please? Father God, we come before you humbly, Lord, and asking you that you would come and you would restore the family unit, Lord. God, we know that your word says that you're going to bring the hearts of the sons back to the fathers mm. and the, the hearts of the daughters back to the mothers, Lord. God, right now, I just ask, Lord, that you would just begin to do that. That, God, that you would begin to call out to each and every person that is separated from their families, Lord, that, that God, they would hear your call and they would come back and they would be restored with their family once again. God, I ask them, um, 
that there would be forgiveness in the family and that God, if there is anything that they have against each other, Lord, that you would just come and restore them yes, back. Lord. And God, I, I pray Psalms 133 that says, Lord, behold how good and how pleasant it is for a brethren to dwell together in unity. I call forth unity to come back into families, yes, Lord, Lord, that they would become unified in one. And God, that they would just not be unified, but they would be unified in you, Lord. God, I decree and I declare that every prodigal son that has walked mm. away from you Thank and you, uh, walked away from your word, Lord, that God, you would begin to... Um, Take your spirit and begin to to go and run after them and call them back home. And God, I pray that they would be as that prodigal son was where he said he came to himself. Lord, I pray that these these children would come to themselves, Lord, and that, God, they would say, I need to come back home and I need Jesus. Lord, I pray that as they come back home, God, that you would so solidify that fa family together, Lord, and you would be caused, become become one unit in that family, Lord, that they're going to be able to go out and do mighty things for you, Lord. God, I thank you that you're working in the families right now, Lord, and each and every one that's here and, and those that are listening, Lord, that every single person, God, we're going to hear reports of the sons coming yes, back God. home, Lord. We're going to hear yes, reports Lord. of the brothers and sisters coming back to God. We're going to hear of the reports of the men standing up and becoming the priest in the yes, home and Lord. teaching and leading their children in into you, Lord, and into Christ, and that in the Word of God, Lord, that they will take their their position seriously, and they'll they'll stand up and declare your works, Lord, so that the rest of the family will follow. Lord, I thank you, God, that God, you're restoring the breach in the family right now, Lord. That right now, God, conviction is coming over all the people's all the um families right now lord and that god if if they've done anything against each other god that they'll ask for forgiveness yes, and god lord. that you'll come and you'll restore them and you'll bring them back in one unified purpose and order for you in jesus name we pray amen amen you know with uh, thanksgiving coming up this is an awesome time to get our hearts right mary did you come and pray for the church i mean now the church needs to arise yes. and be awakened we're talking about praying uh, the prophetic of the oracles of God over these areas. And how many know when God speaks, things change? Um, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospers in his ways, because the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. And also I have one on anxiety and peace. Do not be anxious about anything, mm. but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And because of the situation, our minds have wandered. We've not been in peace. We've not rested in the Lord. And Father, I just ask you right now to forgive us for not resting yeah. in you. But know that we can work and we can go about our ways and still have rest and peace in you father god forgive us for listening to all the hoopla and and everything that's going on out there in the world father god but to focus on you to return our hearts to you father to put our eyes upon you that we turn not to the left nor to the right father but we look unto you and to your hand and unto your word father forgive us for being anxious father and being worrisome and, and in fear lord jesus and right now in the name of jesus i speak to that that we as your people will not walk in fear will not walk yeah. in anxiety yeah. we will not settle in for these things in the name of jesus and i thank you for forgiving us father i speak peace to each and every heart right now that you reign that our feet are shod with the peace of the gospel that we are standing on a firm foundation that our eyes are set up on you our faces are set up on you our hearts are set up on you father in the name of jesus and that your peace father settles into our hearts your word says be still and know that i am god help us to be still still and settle us towards you that we can hear your voice that we can be obedient unto mm. you father and i ask your forgiveness for us not being obedient to you for for going out after and, and listening to, to different things lord that are that's contrary to your word lord and set us father set us for you set our our hearts and our faces for you in your name we thank you for it amen amen, amen. 
Father, I thank you that our political system is bowing their knee. I thank you, Father God, that what the enemy meant for harm, you will turn for good. Because, God, there are those uh, in the White House, the Senate, the Congress, and other areas of judicial decisions, Father, that are bowing their knee before you even now as we speak. We thank you for a nation that is turning to you. We thank you for a nation that, Father God, realizes that there's no hope separate from you. We thank you, Father God, that uh, we will have a government, Father, that will bow their knee and that will stand up and declare your name. Father, we rebuke anything else in the name of Jesus because nothing else shall remain. You said that when a, when a king serves you, the land is at peace. And Lord, so we just speak peace over our land because we have a king that is willing to serve you. And Father, we just ask God for what the enemy meant for harm. Turn it, turn it, turn it. I just speak to it in the name of Jesus. Reveal it, reveal it, reveal it, and shine your light upon it so that, Father, the rest of the world can see you. God, we, we desire for those who are in darkness to come to the light. And so we ask, God, that you would do a change in their hearts. Take the stony heart out and bring a heart of flesh. And, Father, we'll give you praise for what you've already done. In Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. This is our time, saints. This is our time. Jesus is coming. And we need to be sober. And we need to be ready. Amen. Because there are people out there that really, truly need him. But there's one thing I know for sure is without Jesus, we're lost. We have no hope because he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. And I say that to you that's online. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you know, it's one thing to be born on earth, but it's another thing to be born in heaven. And to be born in heaven, you have to accept the way in which God provided for you. And that is saying, Jesus, be the Lord of my life. Come into my heart. Change me, help me to be more like you. And then... They receive the Holy Ghost. Because it's one thing to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior through the death, burial, and resurrection. But it's another thing to be filled with the Spirit. I always call it a gun without bullets. You've got the gun when Jesus enters your life. But you put the Holy Ghost in there and you've got the bullets or the power to do it. And so I just ask you to receive. If you haven't received into your life, all it takes is for you to set some time aside. Give it to Him and let Him come in. He'll take care of the rest. We love you and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. God bless.